Welcome to episode 139 of Angela Watson's Truth for Teachers. I'm your host, Angela Watson, and I'm here to speak life, encouragement, and truth into the minds and hearts of educators and get you energized for the week ahead. Today, I'm sharing six tips from teachers on how to keep your job from ruining your marriage. Visit truthforteachers.com to get the transcript and to share your thoughts and your advice as well in the comments. This episode is brought to you by Brains On, which is an award-winning podcast from American Public Media. It's dedicated to inspiring kids' natural curiosity about the world. The Brains On podcast has over 100 episodes covering real science topics, including everything from why people have allergies to how electricity works. And now Brains On is offering free standards-based curriculum and activities for teachers that go with each one of their podcast episodes. You can learn more and download their free teacher resources at brainson.org slash learn. So we're talking about marriage here today, and I'm going to just use that term marriage in the interest of being succinct. But what we're talking about really is any sort of long-term partnership, any relationship that you have with a significant other, um, because those relationships are going to be impacted by your job and your workload. And I want to talk with you about how to handle that. I'm going to do a whole separate episode in the spring about mom guilt and how teaching could impact your family life if you're a mom or a dad. But your relationship with a spouse or a partner has its own unique challenges. And I think they are worth addressing all on their own. If you have kids, your spouse might already be feeling like the kid's needs come before his or hers. So all your time and energy is going to your work and to your children with nothing given left to this partner that you're committed to for life. So I think that is worth addressing. And when I told members of the 40-Hour Teacher Workweek Club that I was going to do this episode, a teacher named Abby wrote this, and I think you will find this really relatable. She said, I don't have any advice to share here, but I wanted to say that this is the reason why I joined the club. I was literally working 12 to 16 hours Monday to Friday and easily putting in another eight hours on Saturday and Sunday. My coworkers were begging me not to let this affect my marriage, which was only nine months old at the time. My husband was very supportive, but in low moments, he would say things like, I miss my wife, or I want the wife that I married back, because I was constantly crying or biting his head off from the stress of work. I know I was inefficient, and some of that was due to lack of sleep, but I'm not sure what else I could have done differently to not make it a terrible year. I'm using the club to help me identify some things that I can do to make this year go better. And I know that her story is relatable because of the number of emails and private messages that I have gotten over the years from teachers who are telling me literally teaching is ruining my marriage or teaching has already ruined my marriage. And we got divorced because of it. I have heard of husbands giving their wives ultimatums and saying it's either teaching or me. And I've also heard from a lot of club members over the years that they have used strategies from the club to reduce their workload and that has helped them strengthen their marriage and have more time to prioritize and spend time with their partners. So this episode is going to be a slightly different format. I've asked some club members to share some of the things that they are doing to preserve their marriages and their partnerships and to keep teaching from coming in between themselves and their partners. So I'm going to be sharing some of the advice that they've written. And also I'm going to play a couple audio clips so you can hear things in their own words. The first tip is to recognize when your priorities are out of whack. Be honest with yourself about what needs to change and what will happen if things stay the same. Now, I want to start by having you listen to Christy's experience. Christy is a teacher who had a slight shift in her perspective one year, and it ended up changing her entire outlook on her job. What changed it for me was the day after spring break. I went back to school and realized, as much as I love these kids, these students will be out of my class in 10 weeks. And in reality, Most won't give me more than a passing thought for their entire lives. My husband, on the other hand, will be with me every night and every morning for the foreseeable future. Do I want a happy spouse for the rest of my days? Or do I want to continue putting all of my time, effort, and energy into teaching? And as much as I love teaching, I realize that having a happy spouse actually allows me to be a better teacher. I couldn't afford to teach financially or emotionally without his support. So I realized that I needed to put more time, energy, and effort and thought into our relationship. 
And like you say in your materials, sometimes you screw up, but you start over the next day and recommit to do less better. A teacher named Rachel echoed similar sentiments. She wrote, I came to the realization that I'm putting in more work than it's worth. Um, When I realized that I love my students and I love my content, but I love my husband and I love our family even more. I had to decide if I could see myself sacrificing time with them just to teach. Don't get me wrong, I love being a teacher, but it's only part of my identity. And it needs to remain just that, a part of the whole. The club has helped me see that I can be an effective teacher and still live the life that I want during the school year and not feel like I'm letting anyone down. My relationship with myself and with my husband is healthier than it has been ever since I started teaching. I set a firm boundary around my time. If I'm going to bring work home, it needs to be something I can complete before my husband comes home. Wednesdays are our designated date night and we prioritize them. No working past 5.30 p.m. for either of us, and the evening is completely devoted to us time. If a conflict comes up, we move the date to another day, and the same policy applies. I stopped working on the weekends unless it was prearranged or if I can complete the task in less than two hours. The biggest payoff that I've had from the club so far is realizing that my expectations for myself are way higher than my administration's. I can be just as prepared for five preps and not waste my life at school if I'm intentional with my time. It's a work in progress, but I don't feel that teacher guilt as much as I used to. So what Rachel shared there about boundaries around her time, this designated time for work and designated time for her spouse, that was a theme that I heard repeatedly from club members who were offering advice on this. And that's the second strategy. Create boundaries so that you have a designated time for work, a designated time for your spouse, and you don't let those two things mix or interfere. So here's what a teacher named Jamie offered up as her advice. She said, teaching definitely played a part in my first marriage ending. I realized that there was a big problem when the answer to the question, what's most important to you, was my job and not my husband. I flip priorities in my current relationship, but it can still be a struggle. There are seasons when I know and my honey understands that I do have to work a lot more. The beginning of the year, report card times, that sort of thing. The rest of the year, I work hard to put boundaries around my time so that teaching doesn't take up all my time and energy. We schedule two date nights a month. And I try to leave time most nights for us to spend some time hanging out. I also stop bringing work on vacations. Admitting that I did this is a bit embarrassing. We do a couples meeting once a week to check in with each other and to get life organized. I also started using the emails app and we have home cooked dinners together a lot more as a result. So those are really, really great tips and advice in there from Rachel. Thank you for sharing that, Rachel. Now I'm going to let you listen to Lindsay. Lindsay managed to create better boundaries so that she could have more time with her spouse by focusing on um, making sure she knew when her most productive times of day were and trying to get the most things done then. Here's Lindsay. Prior to joining the group, I was working 50 to 60 hours a week and too stressed to enjoy time with my husband or really even focus on our marriage. Um, my def- my marriage was definitely coming in second to school at the time. The biggest shift for me was maximizing my time at school um, and leaving when I stopped being productive. In the past, I would just stay late and try to work, but really I wasn't getting anything done. Then I would be stuck doing even more work the rest of the week. Um, I also adjusted my school plans based on my home life and vice versa. Like if I knew I wouldn't be able to complete my grading on a specific night due to another commitment, I switched out my due dates. So I wouldn't wouldn't be so stressed out trying to do things with my husband and then also trying to grade as well on those same nights. And I, I also looked at how to maximize my energy and time so I could get the most done in the least amount of time, just instead of stretching everything out. Um, there's there's so many strategies from the group that have really just reduced my personal stress, like paperwork management, email management. And I honestly believe that by being less stressed out 
that is making me a happier wife and that is leading to a better marriage. A teacher named Kathy came to similar conclusions, but her aha moment was initiated by her spouse. Listen to what Kathy wrote. She said, my husband literally came to the school one night about seven o'clock, grabbed my hand and drugged me home. We lived about 200 feet from the school then. And he sat me down to what would have been a wonderful supper if I wasn't stone cold. I was told to stop letting the school run us or he would move out. I joined the club and I have found so much help from the quarterly goals. Knowing where the heck I wanted the kids to go in their learning made everything so much more simple. Lesson plans were easier to put together because I knew what we needed and I didn't spend hours on Pinterest trying to figure out what to do next. I set quarterly goals for home also. It helps me to manage holidays and make sure that we get time to play and dance together. That one lesson was worth all the money in the world, and yet I still get ideas from the club to make teacher life not consume everything for me. Now it is my life, and part of that is teaching. The third tip is to have strategies for decompressing after school so that you don't pile all your work stress on your spouse. Now this is something that I learned the hard way myself, that a non-teacher spouse is never going to truly understand the stress of being a teacher. And my constant venting really wore on our relationship. It was frustrating for him to listen to me complain about the same things day after day. And he would often try to fix the problem by offering solutions that I thought were just completely impractical. It seemed like he didn't really understand the expectations, the dynamics of how schools work, and his advice was just not useful. But he also didn't want to just sit and listen to me complain all the time. So when I finally realized, okay, this is just not going to work, I've got to come up with some other kind of way to decompress. And I started going to a colleague instead, I would go to her room right after school, and talk through everything, get everything off my chest, and then I could leave the day's problems at the building. And that really improved my relationship with my husband, who was my fiance at the time. I have found that I was able to leave work, come home, and already have the day's stress behind me rather than coming home and trying to expect my spouse to process it with me. And that's something that a club member named Trish shared. Listen to her experience. Almost three years ago, I joined a gym with my best teacher friend at work, and this has helped my marriage. My husband says I'm much nicer to be with since I started going to the gym with my friend. She is unbelievably efficient. We go to the gym about three to five times a week and share about our day while doing cardio. Then we don't unload all our frustrations on our families when we get home. I had to learn to be more efficient to meet my friend at the gym by a certain time and still be ready for the first class of the next school day. My friend is the most organized person I know and is good at getting packed up and out of school at a reasonable hour. I am not. It feels like it always takes me twice as long as my fellow teachers to get things cleaned up and put away. 40-hour group is helping me practice more efficient habits. Going to the gym and this 40-hour club together help me stop staying at work nine hours a day and putting in another hour or two at home. Since joining this group, my perspective has changed. I used to be proud of the crazy amount of time I put in at work, and I felt like my husband didn't value how important it was for me to put out so much effort. Now I understand I was trying too hard to please the students and their parents. My husband appreciates the efforts I'm making now to be more efficient and mentally and physically healthier. He noticed that I handle little adversities at work and at home better, and we value our time together more. Another key to a happy marriage with a teacher is celebrating the end of a week of teaching. We go to a restaurant a few times a month for cooking free Friday. I enjoy a hard cider and my husband orders a beer while we wait for dinner. We may both need to vent about work while we are waiting for dinner to be served. But within a few minutes, the conversation gradually changes to other topics. And we're joking about the parts of our jobs that usually make us angry, stressed or frustrated. Humor is so important. After 30 years of marriage, we recognize that when we are too tired to even laugh, we usually need some space and rest. Listen, validate, laugh, and stay away from scorekeeping and what my friend and I call bad day poker. If you feel your day was worse, say, I understand you are upset about that, but today I win bad day poker because, and then you can tell about what's driving you nuts. The worst arguments occur when you are too tired to even empathize. 
Did you catch that gem that Trish dropped there in the middle where she felt like her husband just didn't understand how important the job was to her, but she realized it wasn't that at all. The real issue was that she was spending way too much time and energy trying to impress her students and the people in her school. That part really spoke to me. Sometimes what feels like a spouse not understanding is actually them having a clear perspective from the outside. We can't see the forest for the trees sometimes. So when they say, you just need to stop doing X, or you just need to say no to Y, it's possible that they're taking that big picture perspective, which is exactly what we need in order to break out of that. You don't understand. It's just how it is kind of trap. Now, a quick aside here. What if you are married to an educator? Well, Susan is in that position. Her husband works for the district. And here's what she said. She wrote, we have a rule about talking about work only in the car on the ride in and the ride from work. Since we work across the street from one another, we carpool. Once we're home, it's dinner, walk the dog, meditate, etc. It's okay if we do some mindless work while we Netflix or listen to music, but no direct work conversation should be going on at home. We both check in with each other on that because it could be all that we talk about without any boundaries. The fourth strategy is to adjust your voluntary and unpaid work hours to better align with your spouse's work hours. So this strategy has to do with coordinating your work schedule so that you're staying late when your spouse stays late and you both agree not to work extra on specific days. So if your schedule is unpredictable, um, you know, and so is your spouse's, it's really hard to tell what you're going to need to do, then you can just check in with each other during the week. Find out what's happening over the next few days. When should we work? When should we spend time together? And this is a habit that I actually have now with my husband, even though I'm not currently in the classroom, because both of us have unpredictable schedules. So we talk every weekend about what's coming up for the following week. And if he has a day of meetings or if he's traveling out of town, I will block off that time in my schedule to really focus on my work and know that I'm not going to be interrupted. I can just really do some deep work and batch a whole bunch of tasks. And then we'll choose another time when we're both free and plan something so that we have something to look forward to. So, okay, we're not going to see each other much on Thursday and Friday, it sounds like. Why don't we have brunch on Saturday morning? And let's go for a hike on Sunday afternoon. So we're recognizing these times ahead of time. And that really gives us both permission to focus on our own thing. Like we both really love our work. We love what we do. And it's nice to feel like, okay, I have these set aside times this week where I can do that and not feel guilty and not feel like I'm neglecting things at home. And then I also have something to look forward to when the work is done and I can just decompress and relax and enjoy my husband's company. Now there's a teacher named Becky and she's going to talk about how she and her husband handle this situation. Her approach was basically to choose one day where they don't have any obligation to each other. It's her husband's night to do his own thing, and she gives herself permission to stay late at school as needed, and she can also take time for herself. The first thing I did was talk with my principal about my need for a better work-life balance. I gave her my reasons, and she had my back completely. She encouraged me to discuss with my husband having one day I could stay super late to get everything done, and then as soon as I finish that night, I get to do something for me. Together, my husband and I chose Friday night because no one else is at school, and I had no one to get me off task and no one to wait behind in the workroom. Then, after finishing all my work around 6.30, I took myself out for a nice dinner, and I went to a dance class, something I enjoy doing for my own self-care. The rest of the week, I was able to get my day-to-day things done in my contracted time. My weekends became family time because I had finished all of my work before I left Friday. My husband is much happier, and I am too, because I have more time with my family during that time, and I'm not stressing about work waiting for me in my bag because I left it at school. A teacher named Saba echoed the sentiment about aligning hours with your spouses. She wrote, I try to align my work hours with my husband's. I either come in early on a Monday or I stay late on a Friday if it's necessary. Also, I'll end up working during breaks while my husband is at work. So for example, Thanksgiving week, winter break, spring break, et cetera. That has helped me be more present in home and we meal plan on Saturdays and Sundays for the week. So no one is neglected or starving if I'm working. The fifth strategy is to cut out things from your workload and to consider not bringing home any work-related tasks at all. Now, naturally, if you are working long hours, and that's part of why you don't have time with your partner, you're going to have to find ways to cut back 
on your workload. And for many teachers, this practice allows them to stop working at home altogether. A teacher named Jillian shared, honestly, the best thing that I did was start planning out my day, focusing on what had to be done and what could wait. I also decided to let go of perfect and work for good enough. And by doing this, I was able to keep work at work and be present with my family at home. I leave work by five, four days a week. And I only stay late on Fridays because my husband does the same. Our marriage is much stronger as a result. Here's another tip about this from a teacher who chose to remain anonymous. So I am a career changer. I came to teaching a little later in life. And my own kids were middle school up through high school age when I started teaching. And I thought that I would have more time for them. And I ended up really not having time for my husband and my kids. My husband was a little more understanding. He knows, like I do, that any new job is requires a learning, a learning curve and, you know, a lot of dedication, but it really was way too much. And my oldest daughter even said to me, you know, mom, you're just absent because I was working all the time and they would see me every evening, uh, grading and lesson planning and on the computer. And I just wasn't any fun at home because I was working all the time. So it did get better. And I learned through the 40 hour teacher work week and through trial and error and through talking to other teachers. And I learned that I can set boundaries. I do have a right to say no. However, I also learned that there are times when the workload is way more than you can get done during a work day. And especially at the end of a marking period, I have to put in extra time. What worked for me was to do the work at work and then come home even though it was going to be later in the evening. And because my kids are older, I can do that. I can miss dinner a few days at the end of a marking period, but at least I'm not bringing all that work home. And that was a lot better for us, and it was a lot better for me because then when I got home, I was really done for the day. Now, I realize that not working at home at all may not be the goal for some of you. It never was for me. There were a lot of parts of teaching that I enjoyed doing as a hobby, this, the creative tasks especially. And I know for some of you, your schedule and your life circumstances will make it preferable to work at home rather than going into your school building early or staying late. But there were so many club members who responded to this question about protecting their marriage by saying that they stopped bringing home work altogether that I feel like I need to emphasize this as a very real option that is worth you considering. Here's what Martina said about that. She wrote, for me, the thing that changed everything was not bringing any work home, period. Unless it's an emergency or some unforeseen circumstance, I leave my grading, lesson planning, etc. at work. As someone who suffers from depression, I have to be very sure to take care of myself. And for me, that means doing creative things with my spare time. I consider this a lifeline. So when I get home, I play my guitar and I work on my guitar techniques for about an hour. And then I make dinner so we can eat as a family. And after dinner, I read or I do a quick blog entry while enjoying my family's company and a cup of tea. Stop competing, Martina wrote. Stop trying to make your classroom prettier than everyone else's. Stop Pinteresting yourselves to death. Good pedagogy will always trump pretty. Strive for substance, not for trying to make everyone happy, because you will almost always fail at the latter. A sixth strategy is to stop saying that something Here's what Cheska wrote about this. She said, when things were at their worst, I sought a life coach because I thought I needed to switch careers. He told me to write out my obituary. It was strange, but it forced me to write down what kind of life I wanted and how I wanted to be remembered. And my first line was loving wife. Shortly after I joined the 40 hour teacher work week club and it taught me to prioritize tasks by personal values. I would do the most important work for work while I was at work. And then I made sure that I left work at work at the end of the day. I uninstalled my work email account at home and I refused to look at or return any calls outside of work hours. 
I also made sure that when I was home, I focused on my family and my husband, and I didn't bring up work during family time. That has helped me become the loving wife that I wanted to be. And that leads us to the sixth and final strategy here, which is to stop saying that something needs to change and take action. Even small steps in the right direction can make a huge difference. Now, you might be feeling at this point that it's too late, that small preventative shifts aren't going to really work. I'm going to share what a teacher named Lee wrote, and she was really honest and vulnerable here. I really appreciate her transparency because her marriage had hit a breaking point. This is what she said. I thought the busier that I was, the more important and irreplaceable I was to my administration in my school. I taught the same school for 10 years. And as a result, my husband and I became best friends who lived together instead of marital partners. We hit a turning point, a really low point, and I refused to let things continue the way that they had been. I switched schools. I stopped coaching. I stopped teaching AP courses. I gave up all the extra committees and I rededicated myself to our marriage and our family. This is the beginning of year three at my new school, and I have made my life a priority. The club really gave me the permission that I needed to just be good enough for that day and to let go of the stuff that nobody but me noticed. It was super hard. But at my new school, I was the new teacher, and I was given the opportunity to reinvent myself and set reasonable boundaries. I forced myself to stop being at everyone's beck and call. All I did was teach. And it wasn't easy to let all the other stuff go. But I recognized that if I wanted to save my marriage and not have my daughters resent me or my students, then it was another necessary change that I needed to make. So that was a big change. She changed school so she could just completely reset those boundaries and kind of reinvent herself as a teacher. So many people were depending on her in her current work environment that she felt like that's what she needed to do to start fresh. And I really admire that she took those drastic steps. It ended up saving her marriage. But sometimes the most important thing is just to begin taking action. Even a small step can make a big difference. Show your spouse that things are going to be different than they are now. Here's what a teacher named Bridget wrote. She said, I am really new to the club, like July 2018 new. But there was a definite change in my relationship with my husband the second I joined. I think it was the shift from years of venting to, hey, I'm going to actively work on changing my approach, and here's the plan. I know it's not going to be clear sailing all the time, but he knows that I'm putting in the effort, and he's keeping me accountable by checking in to see how it's going. Honestly, I think the biggest change in our relationship will just be this. I stopped talking about how things need to change, and I took action. I encourage you to use these teacher stories to help you take action today. What is one thing you heard that you think you could implement in order to make a positive difference in your relationship with your spouse or your partner? Take that first step. It might be cutting something from your workload so that you aren't bringing so much home. It could be adjusting your schedule to align more with your spouse's schedule. It could be creating routines for decompressing so that you're not bringing that stress of school home with you and you're taking care of yourself, which will make you happier and a better partner. Take action today. And if you're serious about this and you want to get around other teachers who are also serious about it, get on the wait list for the club. Just go to 40htw.com. The next cohort is going to start in January and wait list members are going to be able to get in early. Having the support of other teachers who are trying to get their priorities in order is really, really invaluable. Your takeaway truth for the week ahead is this. Your priorities aren't what you say they are. Your priorities are revealed in how you live. I hope you will take that first step this week to better align your life with your priorities. You can do this. And remember, it's not going to be easy. It's going to be worth it. Want more than just a weekly podcast episode from me? I'd love to also send you a weekly message of encouragement via email. I'll reach out each Sunday evening with a short message that's designed to help you feel more prepared and inspired and motivated for the week ahead. It's not a newsletter or a bunch of announcements. 
This goes out to over 85,000 educators. So I put just as much thought into crafting this weekly written message to my email list as I do into crafting my podcast episodes. And it's entirely unique content that you won't find anywhere else online. Just go to the cornerstoneforteachers.com slash subscribe and you can sign up. That's the cornerstoneforteachers.com slash subscribe.